Thanks, guys. We appreciate that. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship. So glad to, to see you all here to be together on this rainy day. What a blessing to be gathered for the worship of God. What a great thing it is to be God's covenant community here, recognizing who he is and all that he's done for us. What a blessing that is. At Northminster, we have particular ways of doing that. Like, we believe that God has um, called us to a particular way of living out his love, representing him in this world. And we call that moving in, up, and out. I hope you're super tired of hearing us say it because we're going to keep saying it. it's so important because every single one of us, not just uh, the pastors, not just the elders, but every single one of us can live out God's call for Northminster, for our gathered community by, number one, building friendships, getting to know people, moving in, connecting with them in relationships as we get to know one another and encourage one another. Also by moving up as we learn God's word, as we let it sink into our lives and then affect the way that we live, we call it moving up. And we believe that every single one of us is called to move out. That is to serve our neighbor, look around our world, and serve our neighbor with the same kind of love and care that God has given to us. At Northminster, we move in, up, and out. That's what I do. That's what you do. That's what we do as God's called community here. Um, one of the ways that we can uh, serve God is to be in worship together, and we just wanted to take a moment to celebrate um, what a great weekend it was last week, um, and as we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus Christ on Easter, we had that um, sunrise service that was just fantastic, we, as we kind of just remind, were reminded again of the story of Easter, and then we had um, two worship services in this room, and it was great to gather together, even with the people online as we live streamed, to celebrate Jesus' resurrection. Thank you for being a part of that. We really, really want to encourage you to find additional ways to connect with the family and the work here at Northminster. And so we have groups for every single one of us. Kids meet on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. by Zoom. I actually enjoy being with them that way. We connect and we laugh and we share and we grow. And and so if you have a kid in your life, maybe you're a grandparent who has a child in your life, you could join them on that Kids Men Zoom. Um, Join them at 10 a.m. Invite them to be with you. It's a great opportunity. For students, we have, um, for middle schoolers, on Wednesday nights, youth group, and on Sunday nights, we have youth group for high schoolers as we meet and we we share and we grow and we learn and we connect and we build community. And then for adults, we have so many different opportunities for you to meet in life groups, which is just with other adults um, sharing life, talking about what we're learning here in worship and in God's word together. Please consider, if you're not connected in one of those places, please consider connecting with one of them. You can always find more information by going to the website. You can shoot Bob or I an email, and we'd love to connect you with one of those opportunities. Um, Finally, uh, I just want to make sure that you know that if you know someone who needs help, maybe extra prayer, maybe they need to have some errands run, maybe you um, know someone who's currently in quarantine or just needs a little extra uh, hand, we are here to help. That's something that we want to do. And so if you reach out to Pastor Bob or Pam Garner, our co- coordinator of care, or the church office, if you just, even you know a neighbor who needs something, we want to um, be present to help others. Um, again, that's part of who we are as Northminster. So if you're online or you're here in present, thank you so much for being here. Let's go ahead and let's stand and let's greet one another this morning. Say hi to the people around you, wave to the people a little further away, and send greetings. There's a verse in Psalm 48, verse 9. It reads, We ponder your steadfast love, O God, in the midst of your temple. God's steadfast love. There's this term in the Old Testament, uh, said. It's a special word. It appears so many times in, in this idea of reflecting on God's said, His loving kindness. In fact, it's a word that's hard to translate into our language, just we don't have a, an exact word that matches up with it. It's a word that means uh, faithfulness and loyalty, commitment to a covenant. It's also translated as mercy. God has said. 
So I thought this morning as we spend time in worship that we would be able to reflect on God's steadfast love, His loving kindness, His mercy, and that we would use statements from the Psalms that comment on God's steadfast love. And so we'll have a little bit of an interaction over those Psalms, and then there will be this pause of silence for us to be able to reflect. Our first set of verses will focus on praise, and then a pause, and then we'll have a second set of verses, and then that will focus us on confession. There will be a third set of verses, and that will focus us on requesting of God, asking for His intervention. And then the final set of verses will focus on our own spiritual growth, uh, the writing in the Psalms often turn, God, help us grow. Help us uh, grow into all that you would have for us. And so we'll have a little time for reflection also on our own spiritual growth. And then we'll finish off with a couple of verses as well. So let's share together in this time of worship. We, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. We will bow down toward your holy temple in awe of you. We will sing of your might. We will sing aloud of your steadfast love in the morning. For you have been a fortress for us and a refuge in the day of our distress. We will exult and rejoice in your steadfast love. Because you have seen our affliction, you have taken heed of our adversities. Because your steadfast love is better than life, our lips will praise you. Let us spend some time reflecting and praising. Turn, O Lord, save our lives. Deliver us for the sake of your steadfast love. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out our transgressions. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love. For they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of our youth or our transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember us for your goodness sake, O Lord. Let your face shine upon your servants. Save us in your steadfast love. Let us reflect and spend time in confession. Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, so that we may rejoice and be glad in all our days. Help us, O Lord our God. Save us according to your steadfast love. 
Let your steadfast love come to us, O Lord, your salvation according to your promise. In this time of reflection, let's also in, intercede on behalf of others and ask for things ourselves. The earth, O Lord, is full of your steadfast love. Teach us your statutes. Let your steadfast love become our comfort according to your promise to your servants. Deal with your servants according to your steadfast love and teach us your statutes. We have not hidden your saving help within our hearts. We have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. We have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. In reflection, let's also pray for our spiritual growth. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. Do not, O Lord, withhold your mercy from us. Let your steadfast love and your faithfulness keep us safe forever. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you are a God who is known for your love. That you are a covenant-keeping God. That you keep your fellowship with your people. That every promise that you make, you fulfill. You keep your covenant with Noah and Abraham and Moses and David and the new covenant through Jesus Christ, you are the covenant keeping God, the faithful, steadfast, merciful, loving, kind God. And we do give you praise. We're grateful of this day that your eye is upon the whole of this world and that every single person is known to you that you have created all people in your image and that regardless of the color of their skin or the flag that flies over their nation, you have sent your son to die for these people you've created in your image. And so we pray, God, that your, your grace and your mercy would be extended to many more people even this day that the good news of Jesus Christ would be preached throughout the world. And that every single follower of Christ on this day would share the good news of Jesus with someone. Whether that's in a, uh, some kind of an electronic uh, communication or in a phone call or, or reaching out just with the person across the street. God, may this day know people coming to faith. May this day know people in light of your mercy choosing to share that 
that good news of Christ with others. We pray your healing a hand upon the land. And again, upon all people, that, that people facing the spread of the COVID-19 virus, that, that people facing hardships of one kind or another, hunger or extreme poverty, severe storms, political unrest. God, may there be justice in the land. May there be healing in the land. May there be your peace in every land. And God, we, we give you a, a green light to speak into each of our lives as if you need that. We pray, though, that you would guide us, that, that you would find us faithful this week in all that we do, the way we treat people under our own roof, the way we interact with people around us. May, may we shine forth your light. We pray on this day that you would be with Ron and Kathy, that you would be with Steve, Monica, and Anjali, that you would be with Tracy, God, that you would be with Terry, Ray Lynn, so many others, God, that you'd watch over them and provide for them. And so we offer together now this prayer that Jesus taught, and we ask that you would hear us as we pray to you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. if you guys have seen the statistics of the past couple weeks about the way Americans are engaging with their faith during the pandemic. Did you guys see the um, numbers that came out this week, or maybe it was last week? Um, for the first time since Gallup, the Gallup organization has been asking the question, so for the first time since 1937, fewer than 50% of Americans say that they hold formal, formal membership in a religious body. So only 47% of Americans right now say they belong to a church, a mosque, or a synagogue. But interestingly, the Pew Research Center also came out with a study that said that 3 in 10, or almost 30% of American adults, report that their faith has deepened during the pandemic. Those are, those are interesting, seemingly contrasting statistics, which makes this the perfect time to be talking about, to be asking ourselves, what is faith? What are we talking about when we talk about being the member of a body of people who are gathered together around a, around a faith commitment and the practice of that faith? And so we've been in the middle of this study we're calling Faith People, where we've been walking through these stories of the Old Testament and seeing what, is the, what does the faithfulness in the people in the Old Testament teach us about what faithfulness should look like for you and I now? Let me remind you of where we've been because we're picking up the story this morning in Joshua 2. So if you have your Bible, that's where you're going to want to go. I really encourage you to go ahead and look it up for yourself. Joshua 2, if you're at home, go ahead and pause and go grab your Bible because we'll be referring to it often. And let me remember, remind you what has brought us here, right? So hundreds of years before this passage is written, God comes to a man named Abram and says, I'm going to send you to a place that's going to be your inheritance. And he calls Abram out as, as, as the one through whom his blessing is going to come. And so he makes these promises to him, hey, your descendants will be like the stars of the sky and the sand of the sea, seashore, and then giving you this land to, to have as an inheritance, and I'm going to bless you so that you will bless all nations. And Abraham and his descendants walk before the Lord, and Lord, the Lord proves faithful to those promises. But then drought and famine come upon that promised land that he had, he had promised to them, and they have to leave. And Joseph makes a way for them to go to Egypt where they become enslaved. 
But after hundreds of years, God remembers them in Egypt and sends Moses to rescue them. And so through, through the events of the plague and the plagues and the Passover and, and uh, the Red Sea and the Exodus, here comes God's people out of slavery to the mountain of Sinai where God tells them who he is and gives them his commands and says, hey, walk before me and be blameless and I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my royal priesthood. And they really mess things up. And so we come now to Joshua, and we find out here at the very first part of Joshua, we have these words. Here's what God says. He says, Moses, my servant, is dead. What a way to start a book, right? Moses, my servant, is dead. And so Joshua is going to take control of the people. But here this really interesting thing happens that we're going to look at too. It's like this whole time the camera of the movie, of the story that we've been hearing, of the history we've been observing in the Bible, it's like the camera is going to shift now. It's been on the Israelites, and all of a sudden it's going to go whoom, right over to a city called Jericho and to the Canaanites in that city, to the people who were outside of the promise. And the, and the scene shifts, and, and onto the stage walks this sinful Canaanite woman who was going to demonstrate greater faith than anyone in Israel had. And so we're going to look at her story today. We're going to tell her story because in her story we have a picture of faith that that helps us, that teaches us what our faith should look like. So I'm going to tell the story briefly, then we're going to read in Scripture what Rahab, the Canaanite woman, has to say, and then we're going to talk about how it applies to us. Chapter 2 starts off with Joshua sending two spies into the promised land. The nation of Israel is camped uh, over to the east of the Jordan, across the river from the land that God has promised them as an inheritance, and he sends two spies, and here's the deal, you guys, they are terrible spies. I mean, truly terrible spies. So they get to Jericho, and the first thing that happens is the king is aware that they're there, right? So not sneaky at all. We shouldn't even, like, grant them the name of spies. But they end up in Jericho, and the king's like, I'm on to you. And they go in Jericho, right, where anyone would go. They go to where, where people, outsiders would come, which was like the um, combination in slash bar slash tavern slash brothel. It was where outsiders would come to visit. And the proprietor of that place is a woman named Rahab. And uh, and Rahab, we have this big suspense that builds in the story because what's going to happen here? The spies are in her place, and what is she going to do? Because the king has come and said, hey, um, we know that there's the spies have come here. There's Israelites among you. And to our great surprise, she protects them. She covers for them. She's like, no, 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 they've, they've gone on ahead. Um, if, you, if you leave now, you might be able to catch up with them. And she protects them, and she talks to them, and then she um, helps them get safely back out of the city and back to God's people. And, and if we were an ancient hearer or reader of this story, and maybe even us today, we should be at this moment at the end of chapter two going, who is this woman? Like, like, where did she even come from? What has happened? The story was all about the patriarchs and, and the nation of Israel, and all of a sudden the camera zoomed in on her, and what's going on here? Well, let's let Rahab tell us what's going on here. Let's read, and we're in Joshua again, chapter 2, starting in verse 8. We're just going to read her conversation here. Here's what the scripture says. It says, before the men, that's the spies. So before the spies lay down, she came up to them on the roof, and she said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, Our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house. Give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and deliver our lives from death. And the men said to her, Our life for yours, even to death. If you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. 
Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was built into the city wall so that she lived in the wall. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this example of Rahab. And I ask that this morning that your spirit would enlighten our hearts, would open our eyes, would, would tender our spirits to think about what it means to be a people of faith. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. So that's all we're going to do this morning. We're just going to look at some hallmarks of Rahab's faith. What is it about what Rahab has done here that might instruct us about what it is to have faith in God? Well, here's the first thing we need to know is that her faith is in God. It has the proper object. You know, what is faith? You know, we make a big mistake if we think faith is just something we do with our head. Right? So if we think faith is just a thing that I, I look at and I say, okay, I, I hear these things are true and I'm going to believe them and that is faith. But that's not faith. Faith is something that we do with our whole selves. The simplest way to talk about faith is to say that faith is really just uh, trusting and relying on something else. So if you're in this room right now, I'm looking down and everyone's seated and maybe you're at home and you're seated. If you're sitting down right now, surprise, you are exercising faith because you are trusting and relying on that chair, that seat you're sitting in right now, to hold you up. And if you've ever had a chair not hold you up, you know why it's faith, right? So every one of us, we're just relying on something. We're, we're taking an action. It's not that we have a mental idea, a mental picture of what it is to trust a chair. It's that you're actively trusting your chair right now. Faith is just actively trusting and relying on something else, and it is the same with biblical faith. We trust and rely on God. Did you notice that Rahab knows who God is? So look back down at verse 11. At the end of that verse, here's what she says. She says, the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Notice what Rahab knows to be true about God. She knows that God is in charge both above and and below. He is sovereign. He's in control. That's what sovereign means. He's, he exercises authority over all that is. She's aware of that about God. She's also aware that God is someone that has revealed himself to us. God is someone that you know. Do you notice he, she calls him your God, as though God were someone that we have a personal relationship with, as though God were someone that we know. But also she knows that God is active she knows that God has been at work among the people, leading them where they need to go, giving them victory where they need to have victory. God is moving and active in the world. And I love also that she refers to God as the Lord. And I'm sure many of you know this, but when you're reading Scripture and you come across Lord written in all capital letters, so capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that is the way that our translators help indicate to us the personal name of God. So there's Yahweh. The name that, that God revealed to Moses at the burning bush. What are you supposed to call me? Remember when we learned about this several weeks ago? Like Yahweh, we're, we're, that's God's name. And Rahab knows God's name. She knows everything that God has done. Look at verse 10. She knows that God had dried up the Red Sea so that they could escape Egypt. She knows that God has given them victory over the kings of the Amorites. She knows that God has been active in history. And because of this, knowing God's character and what she has done, she can put her faith in him. I've been thinking about this a lot because I've been working to sell my dad's house, and so I've been talking to a ton of realtors, and there's not a single realtor that I've spoken to that hasn't said some version of this you can trust me. Those other guys, be careful. But you can trust me, right? There's, we all know that there's a connection between uh, character and actions. So Rahab's faith is in God, just as yours is. The same God that my faith is in, the same God I rely in and trust on. God is the object of our faith. Not our deeds, not our parents' faith, not our tradition, not our history, our faith is properly placed in God. But notice what else? Rahab's faith is confident in God's promises. It has the proper substance. I love how Rahab starts her conversation with them. She, just, she gets right to it in verse 9, and she just announces, I know that the Lord has given you this land, which seems like maybe a sentence we might read over, but let's pause here because Rahab is confident in the promises of God to an extent that we should see. 
God has promised way back, this is, first of all, Rahab is restating the covenant promises that were to Abraham and re-given to, to Moses and to the people. God had told Abraham all those years ago, this land belongs to you. It is the land of promise, the promised land. And here's Rahab like, hey, I know this land God has given to you. So she's restating the covenant truth of God. But also, notice she is doing what the Israelites could not Right here is this sinful Canaanite woman who kind of states fearlessly, like she just like totally proclaims the truth that the rest of God's people had been struggling with for 40 years. Do you remember the story? Right, 40 years early, most, earlier, Moses had sent spies into the land. He sent 12 spies into those lands. You remember we learned about this, Bob taught us, and, and 10 of those spies came back and they said, yeah, I don't know, it's a little sketchy. The people there are really big, we might have problems. Two of them came back and said, it's okay, God has given us this land. And the people believed the bad report. The people believed the 10 spies who said, yeah, I don't know if this is really gonna happen. God's people did not even demonstrate the same faith that Rahab did. They didn't know if they were sure that God had given that land to them, and so they wandered for 40 years in the desert. Rahab believes what God has promised, even though it hasn't happened yet. So isn't it interesting that here's this woman living in the walls of Jericho, right? Jericho, this fortress city. Jericho is the barrier between God's people and the promised land. If you're going to go take the promised land, you're going to have to go through Jericho. And here she is literally living in the walls of Jericho, knowing that those walls will have to fall for God to fulfill this promise. Yet she says boldly, I know God's given you this land. She has confidence in the promises of God. Think about the verse that I used to hear my grandparents say all the time. Some of you remember this. Uh, 2 Timothy 1, Paul says, I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep all that he has promised me for that day. That is faith. I am persuaded that God is faithful to his promises. So we see in Rahab that her faith has the proper object, that it has the proper substance, but we also see that Rahab's faith acts. Rahab's faith does something. Rahab's faith is a verb. Did you see in verse 12, she tells the spies, she says, look, I've dealt kindly with you. Like, I've, I've, I've protected you. I've taken care of you. I, I sent the king's men looking the other way. She, she you friends, she has committed treason against her king and country. We, we know we can look at the old law codes uh, in that area of the ancient Near East. You can even look up good old uh, Hammurabi's code, and you can see that it literally spells out that an alewife, if an alewife hides an insurrection in the town from the king, she's liable to death, <laughs> right? Uh, Rahab acts. To put it simply, she switches sides. Her allegiance is no longer to Jericho and its king. Her allegiance now belongs to Yahweh. And another word for changing sides is repentance. Right? Repentance is just saying, my allegiance to the things of the world was misplaced before. Doing things the way the world wanted me to do them, the sinful way that I wanted to do them, that allegiance was misplaced, and now I'm switching and I'm turning away from that. And I'm saying, God is my Lord. God is my sovereign. God is my king. And I will worship and follow and obey him. That is repentance, and it is what she does. You know, where it's a little hidden in the translation because she says, I've dealt kindly with you, and, and what a providence that um, God had uh, led Bob to have our worship time this morning around the word hesed, because hesed is the word that's used right here. She says, she says down in verse, um, in verse 12, she says, I have shown hesed to you. Covenant love, steadfast mercy and kindness. She says, look, I'm, I'm in. I'm showing you the kind of love that defines your God. I have protected you. 
I'm not loyal to this kingdom in this place anymore. I'm loyal to God. What's interesting to me is this is true for us as well. Did you see Rahab says that other people in the land had heard about them, right? So she says, look, all the inhabitants of this land have heard what I've heard, and we're all quaking in fear of it. But as far as we know, Rahab is the only one who acted in response to it. As far as we know, Rahab is the only one who made a change in response to the truth of who God is and what he was doing and there's certainty of the promises. One of the reasons we know that is another hallmark of her faith, and that's that it produced evidence. Rahab's faith produces evidence. So the spies tell Rahab, they say, look, here's what you need to do. If, if we're going to be, if we're going to, you know, keep this deal, if we're going to continue to show loving kindness to one another, here's what's going to have to happen. We need you to tie a red cord in your window. Then we need to keep everyone, you need to keep everyone that you want to be safe under your roof. So keep them here, your, your parents, your siblings, their families. We can only protect who's under your roof. And so if they're not under your roof, they're not in your house, we can't guarantee their protection. And the third thing they say is don't tell anyone. This has to be a secret. And so what does she do? We're told in verse 21 this, that Rahab says, according to your words, so be it. And then she sent them away, and they departed, and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. You know, in my mind, in my imagination, here she is leaning out the window, letting the spies down, watching them depart, knowing that her life has now completely altered. And there she is, and she watches them scurry off in the dark in the direction she has sent them to avoid capture. And can't, I could just imagine her whispering to herself, how long till they come back? How long will it be? And then running to find the red cloth to tie in her window immediately. And then I think about the days that must have passed for her. And that in-between time, the in-between time when they said, look, we've got you, we are going to protect you. And they, and they run off, and then the time that those walls fall and she is rescued, what must it have been like for her in the in-between I was trying to calculate how long it would have taken, and, and, and I don't know that I could come up with an exact number, but we know that she tells the spies to hide for days, and then they're going to have to get back across the river where they're going to have to, to, it's going to take them several days to do that, and then we know that there's this plan that has to hatch because God hasn't even told them the plan about the walls falling at Jericho and march around and play the trumpets and the whole thing. And so that plan has to come, and then, then Joshua sets up for the people to consecrate themselves for several days, and then they have to cross the actual Jordan, and then once they... It takes them all that time to cross the Jordan. They get across and they build memorials from stones that were in the middle of the Jordan. So they have to build these memorials. And then, do you guys know what happens when they get across the river? God says, all right, now it's time. For 40 years, you haven't been practicing circumcision. It's time for all of the guys to get circumcised. And, they, and, and it specifically says they're going to get circumcised and they have to heal before anything can happen. So I just imagine all that in-between time for Rahab who's choosing not to say anything, who's keeping that cord in her window, who's telling her family, look, I need you to come stay with me for a few weeks, maybe for a few months to be safe. How do, you know Abraham had, or how do we know Rahab had faith? Because she persevered and obeyed. It's the same thing for you and I. We are in the in-between, between the promise of resurrection and its fulfillment. And so we wait for what God is doing. Also, her faith cost her. So it's not just that her faith is in the right place, that it has the right substance, that it's produced repentance, and that it's led her to persevere and obey. It's that also now her faith has cost her. Cost her. She has given up everything. The, the, the simplest way I know to say it is just this. Rahab has heard the story of who God is and what he has done, and she has believed the promise of what he's going to do. And so in response, she has entrusted her whole life to this God and has held nothing back. This is the response of faith. 
Think about her walking around the streets of Jericho during those weeks, maybe those months, as she's waiting for the deliverance that God has promised and thinking all of this is going to disappear. All of it's going away. The things that she had known, the things she was familiar with, the things she had put her confidence in, the people that she'd known, the community that she had built, she had to be walking around thinking all of this is disappearing. Have I made the right decision? This is going to cost me everything that I know to be true about life. This is going to cost everything that I've built my life on. Am I crazy? Surely she must be counting the cost. Which is exactly what God told us we do when we live by faith. He says these crazy hard things, right? He says that unless you, you're willing to, by comparison, hate your father and mother and leave everything behind. He's constantly telling people to sell everything and give it to the poor and then come follow. Or maybe most famously, right? He says, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself daily, take up his cross and follow me because whoever wants to save his life is going to lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. And surely Rahab is a picture of that. It will cost her everything to put her trust in the promises of God. At any moment, she could have decided she was wrong. And she could have gone to the king and she said, you know what, I've fibbed, they're coming. I know that they're here, but she doesn't. And she pays the price, which means that even though her faith has cost her her former way of life, her faith has also led to a new family. Her faith has led to a new family, and she becomes a part of God's people. That's the last hallmark of Rahab's faith. It leads her to a new family. And so we have this beautiful picture at, in the end of chapter 6 where, where the, the fall of the walls of Jericho is recounted and we're told this in verse 25, but Rahab, and the prostitute, but Rahab the prostitute and her father's household and all who belonged to her, Joshua saved alive. And she has lived in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out the land. Rahab gets a new family. Can't you imagine the day the walls fell and the spies come in to grab her and and the promises have come true. Everything that she knew is gone. But here's the new life ahead. The new family of God. Friends, we aren't saved to go out and do faith on our own. We don't trust God to go out and be a Lone Ranger Christian to find what's easy for us and natural for us and makes us feel good. We are saved into a community of other believers, a new family to whom we belong. And so as we look at the whole of Rahab's story, I think about the costliness of faith. I mean, this is what a Christian does, right? This is the summary of the Christian life. It's just this, that the Christian life is just living by faith in the promises of God. And I think, have we counted that cost? What it truly means to live by faith in his promises? You know, Rahab, she couldn't hold on to Jericho and enter the promised land. She couldn't keep what was comfortable. She couldn't keep what was familiar and follow after God. And so you and I, we have to let go of our Jerichos as well. What are the places that you and I run to for refuge? What are the places that we're familiar with and the things that we're comfortable with? What are the things that have given us a sense of, of, of God's presence, a, or a sense of, of our comfort? What are the things that have given us an idea that God is in control, or that, that we could be in control of our own lives? And God says, those are the things that it will cost you. It will cost us To know that the things that we look to for comfort and achievement and familiarity will one day be destroyed. But the family of God will not. I can't help but think about the other people in Jericho who were melting in fear, right? The other people who heard the truth, the same truth that Rahab heard. 
but they had never chosen to switch allegiances. I keep thinking about what it was like for those people on that day. That they knew God, they knew who he was, but they hadn't counted the cost and chosen to follow. And so I look at Rahab's life and I think about us. And I wonder about you and where you are in this story and how you feel about this story. You know, I think for some of us, I want to say, be encouraged. Be encouraged. Your faith is not misplaced. God is who he says he is. God will do what he says he will do. For others, I want to tell you, you may have agreed to the truth of who God is, but has never made an impact on your life. And you've kept faith as something that you do with your head instead of something that you do with your whole life. And I hope that, that for those of you who are in that place, you're challenged by Rahab's example to forswear allegiances that are contrary to God and submit to his lordship alone. Some of you may say, Joss, I know there's a cost. I know there's a cost to following because I've been paying it. And I've had hardships in my relationships and, 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 I, and I sometimes struggle with what God wants me to do with my, with my uh, resources and, and sometimes it puts me at odds with other people and, and I know that there's a cost and to you I want to say, keep going. God knows. Some of you need to be reminded that to be a person of faith is also to be a member of a family. It's not something that we do on our own. It's not something that we can maintain on our own. To be a person of faith is to be invited into a new community of people who belong to God. Finally, I, I began thinking about myself and maybe others in this room at the end of Rahab's story. And I was thinking how intensely in the past year I've been feeling that in-between time where the promises have been made and yet they have not been fulfilled. And to myself and to you, I want to say this, keep on trusting, persevere. God's promises are sure. There is a land of promise. He will return one day. There will be new creation. All things will be restored. We will be with him forever. He is working all things for the good of those who believe. He has the goodness of his people on his heart at all times. He is patient and loving and kind, and you and I can trust those promises in the in-between. Your endurance and your obedience is the proof of your faith. And so faith may be costly, but the grace that comes with it is priceless. You know, I think about what happened when Rahab walked out of those walls. Here's what we know. We know that Rahab joins that covenant community of God's people, and she marries a man named Salmon, and Rahab and Salmon have a baby named Boaz. And Boaz will rescue and redeem a woman named Ruth. And Ruth and Boaz will be the grandparents to a boy named David. And he will be named king. And from his line, God promises the throne will never depart. And from David's line, from Rahab's line, comes the anointed one, Jesus Christ. And through Jesus Christ, we are brought in to a new family. Scripture tells us to that to all who receive them, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And the word believed there, right, you guess it, is faith. To those who have faith in Jesus, he gave the right to become his children. So here is our great, 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 great grandmother Rahab looking at you and I, the most unlikely person, a sinful Canaanite woman from the walled city of Jericho who looks at you and I and says, 
This is faith. Let's live it. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you so much uh, for the story of Rahab. I thank you that in her actions and in her words and in her lineage, we see a picture we didn't get anywhere else. what it means to have faith in the promises of God and to live by them in a sacrificial way, in obedience and perseverance as a member of a new family. And God, to whatever extent any of us watching at home or present in this room are wrestling with any of those things, with any of what it means to be your people of faith, God, would you encourage us with the story of Rahab? And would we, to a deeper and greater and more consistent extent, trust and rely on you alone? We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. So thanks for being here. We're so grateful for you all. Grateful for you guys watching at home. If you're in this room and you have a gift to leave, there's um, buckets at the back of the room as you, as you go. And, uh, and for the rest of you, um, be blessed. Be encouraged. God's promises are sure. And though we are in between, we will see them one day and we will rejoice. Amen. Be blessed.